Good evening, everybody. This is Jeff J. Brown, China Rising Radio, Sino Land, and Chiang Mai, Thailand, and halfway around the world in Florida. I am so happy to have back on the show again, David Pear. How are you doing, David? I'm awake. <laughs> it's, uh, I just got I just got up a few minutes ago, and uh, so it's eight. It's nine o'clock here, uh, or almost nine o'clock uh, in the morning, uh, Eastern Standard Time, and you're uh, uh, just the opposite, right? Nine o'clock. Yeah, nine, yeah, yeah, we are okay. over the north over the North Pole, and we <laughs> we. We connect a solid line. Hey, listen, this is not the first time I've had David on, but let me tell you a little bit about him because the, he is quite quite a uh, an active um, uh, anti-imperialist. He is a progressive columnist writing on economic, political, and social issues. Uh, his articles have been published by Op-Ed News, where he is also an active editor. The Greenville Post, The Real News Network, Truth Out, Consortium News, Global Research, and many other publications. David is active in social issues relating to peace, race, race relations, and religious freedom, homelessness, and uh, equal justice. David is a member of Veterans for Peace, St. Pete for Peace, Code Pink, and International Solidarity Movement. I'm also proud to say that he is a fellow founding member of the Bioweapon Truth Commission and has contributed to its global online library. He has traveled to South Korea to study the Korean War. He has been to Palestine uh, on uh, more than one occasion through the International Solidarity Movement. Uh, he has been very active. Uh, he has done people-to-people -people delegations to Cuba with Code Pink. Uh, he um, uh, and and he has done up uh, for uh, for more than uh, uh, friendly reasons, but he has been to Russia on numerous occasions as a private citizen. Uh, David has a bachelor's uh, degree in economics from the University of Maryland and attended classes at George Washington University for a degree as a certified financial planner. I wish I had money. I'd ask you for some advice. He is a graduate of the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, which is very world famous for a degree and certified investment management management analyst, CIMA. He is resides in beautiful Clearwater Beach, Florida. His hobbies include boating, which makes sense being on the coast, fishing, RVing, and motorcycle touring. He is also a licensed skydiver, but humbly admits that he um, is inactive at this point. I've had him on the show twice, uh, and we need we should get together more often. We talked about his amazing um, uh, travels to uh, Korea and everything he learned there about the um, about the Korean War, and he had also had just gotten back from Palestine uh, uh, to report there. Today we're going to talk about his recent trip to Russia, and as someone asked Miss, Mrs. Lincoln, other than that, how did you like the play? David commented to me before this show started that other than coronavirus, this is one of his most memorable trips back to um, to Russia. And so, anyway, thanks for being on the show, David, and and uh, and really and really glad that you're here. You're quite welcome, Jeff, and uh, you're doing quite a service for uh, anti-imperialism uh, yourself. So, yeah, keep up the good work. Hey, listen, your family connections and how that made your time in Russia more meaningful than just, be, you know, uh, we need to let everybody know that you're not just a, a tourist, you know, hopping on a bus. You do have family connections there. Tell us about that. Okay, so um, my wife is um, Russian, and uh, she immigrated to the U.S. Uh, back when the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, I guess in the early 1990s because her life fell apart and she had an opportunity to come to the U.S. And uh, uh, we've been married for about 20 years since the mm -hmm. uh, early early 2000s. So I had actually been to Russia before I got married. Uh, I met my wife in the U.S. I, I didn't meet her in Russia, but um, in any event, I'd been there before. And uh, so my wife still has friends, relatives, she owns a mm -hmm. condominium in um, outside of uh, Moscow, 
And uh, she has not become uh, thoroughly Americanized. She loves to go back to Russia and visit. And, <laughs> I mean, she goes every year, sometimes twice a year. And often I will go with her. I've probably been there about a dozen times or so. Wow, and it, 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 lucky anywhere, guy. Yeah, anywhere between three weeks to three months is, uh, you know, a typical trip. So it's a, it's a long way. So you need at least three weeks. Yeah. Is she an Eastern girl from the Asian part, uh, east of the Ural Mountains, or is she a no, Western girl? Uh... No, 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 she's from, she's from Moscow. She, okay. Uh, she All right. in, Big city girl. In Moscow. Yeah. She, uh, and she, uh, during the year, during the Soviet Union, she worked, um, um, in, um, uh, some of the hotels, um, uh, such as the Cosmos, which I'm not sure. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah, they got, you know, that's, uh, they've got a big statue of uh, Charles de Gaulle out front. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. That's amazing. Yeah. So she, so that's how she learned English, and she also speaks Italian, and, and um, uh, that's how she uh, happened to come to the U.S. Uh, someone met her there and, and offered her offered her uh, a, a trip to the U.S. and she said, what the heck, my life's falling apart. <laughs> yeah, uh, the were, country's they're... falling apart. Yeah, they they mm -hmm. uh, laid off a lot. They She got laid off from the hotel. And, and uh, so anyway, she that's a uh, uh, long story short, I guess. You went to Crimea. Uh, you went to Rostov-on-Don. Uh, you went to Volgograd, which uh, used to be called Stalingrad. Um uh, and uh, you went to the to the caucus. Um, uh, to, uh, how long how long was your trip this time, David? Well, we were we I left at the end of January, and we were planning on staying until May first, but uh, ended up uh, because of uh, the coronavirus uh, and things were shutting down in Russia. Ended up coming back uh, March twenty fourth. Okay, so, well, that's still a long trip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a long trip, and uh, and the last few trips uh, there, uh, I kind of kid my wife. I said, I, I want to show you Russia because, <laughs> you know, she, she hasn't really seen a lot of this stuff. Actually, I I had been to um, Saint Petersburg and to uh, Crimea before, back before I even knew her, and uh, as well as Moscow, and uh, so. Uh, she had never been to St. Petersburg, so the one trip I took her to St. Petersburg, and then uh, wow. she'd never been to Yalta, so I took her to Yalta, oh, and, wow. and we toured around. We last year we went to Georgia, uh, which was an interesting trip too. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, it's a beautiful Georgia is a beautiful, be beautiful country. The oh, only thing you beautiful. have to get over you, when you get out off the airport in um, uh, Tbilisi. You just have to get over the shock of seeing a huge mural of George W. Bush uh. and then going into Tbilisi on George W. Bush Avenue. Oh, but uh, once once you get into T Tbilisi, it's uh, it's absolutely beautiful there. <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Unbelievable. It, it, it reminds me of Italy, really. <laughs> I, I felt like I was in Italy. If I shut my eyes, I felt like I was in Italy. I was there in 84, and it was just spectacular. Yeah. Well, listen, tell us about Crimea. It is, of course, just give us a little bit for people who are maybe not familiar with it. It's that sort of lozenge-shaped uh, isthmus uh, in the Black Sea uh, on the southern belly of uh, Ukraine, and and uh, it, it, it has a uh, infamous history um, with Khrushchev and uh, um, and uh, him attaching it to Ukraine, I guess, back in the 50s, and then the Crimeans uh, voting to uh, join back uh, with Russia. Just tell us about Crimea, the people you met there, and uh, and uh, what they think what they think of uh, what's going on, and and um, and how they're doing. Okay, well, I just start off. I don't really engage um, in political talk uh, too much with uh, with uh, strangers or, or people that I meet on the mm -hmm. road and so forth uh, but uh, no what we um, uh, flew into um, Moscow and we stayed there a couple of weeks to get over the uh, jet lag and then um, 
we mapped out where we wanted to go because I and I wanted to go to uh, Crimea and Stalingrad for quite a long time. So we flew from Moscow to uh, Crimea uh, to the uh, airport there. And um, then from there, you, you it's a very long bus ride to Yalta. And so we got on the bus and, and we went to Yalta. And I, I didn't realize how mountainous Crimea is. It's uh, very hmm. mountainous. And yeah, there was some snow up on top of the mountain and, and the buses, uh, you could see people uh, had, uh, who weren't able to make it up the snowy roads and uh, they were kind of wow. off to the side there. So at, uh, the bus was made it and, um, and when we got to um, Crimea, I was really pleasantly surprised again just how beautiful Crimea is. It's just, it's just a very beautiful seaside resort. Mm -hmm. um, not too many people speak English in, in Russia. The younger people do, but not too many uh, otherwise. But in, in Yalta, like uh, uh, other tourist spots, I guess you might say, you know, did have uh, more English speakers. I'm, I'm not fluent in Russian, unfortunately, although I've studied it for 20 years. I just can't, I just can't, uh, uh, it just goes in one ear and out the other. But <laughs> Every everybody everybody was everybody was happy there. I mean, uh, it was uh, everything was normal. I didn't see any demonstrations. Uh, it wasn't. It was the off season, of, of course. Um, the the season is really in the in the summertime there. The Black Sea is just beautiful, and um, I mean, they had uh, just all sorts of shops, and everything was open. Now, you know, the, the um, coronavirus had, had uh, just started to become a big deal at the end of January in the U.S., but everything was uh, completely normal in Russia when I got there. Nobody was concerned about it. Nobody was talking about it. Everybody was going about their business. And Russia had reported very, very few cases. Um, I don't know if that means that they didn't have many cases or they didn't know of, of the cases or whatever, but they had reported really only a handful of cases. Russia had, had closed the border with China immediately when this uh, whole thing mm -hmm. happened. I mean, in January, they had closed the border with China. So a lot of people just kind of had the feeling that this was a Chinese problem and that uh, uh, that it wasn't really affecting them. And so everybody was going about their business, and and it was just uh, like I say, just a, a lovely sea resort. We we did go on a tour, um, and of course went to the um, cast the uh, not castle, the um, palace, the 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 czar's summer palace in Yalta, where the famous uh, Yalta Agreement was mm -hmm. uh, was agreed to, where at that famous picture of Stalin and. Um, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt sitting there in the palace garden. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's, it's very moving. You know, you go there, you're looking at history. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you, you see the, you see the chairs there where they sat and everything. Wow. And, um, yeah, so it's just, you know, the, it was really a very moving trip. And, and, uh, I guess the, the only, um, uh, really kind of funny, um, uh, uh, experience I had with, with, uh, Politics was uh, uh, in the in the shops there, the bazaar. Uh, I don't know. I was trying to find a, a bathing suit because they, you know, they do have these um, baths. Uh, Russians mm -hmm. love their love their spas, their mm -hmm. you know uh, baths and hot. So I was trying to find a, and I uh, was talking to this one guy, and he was asking me what dirty words I knew and so forth, <laughs> <laughs> and and in Russian. And um, and uh, I asked him, I said, are you Russian? Because, you know, he could have been Ukrainian or Russian. And, uh, and he yeah. laughed and he said, yeah, now I am. And he thought that was, <laughs> he was very tickled about the whole thing. He said, I've lived here all my life and and uh, uh, I used to be Ukrainian, but now I'm Russian. And, um, <laughs> you know, this whole this whole thing with Ukraine and Russia is uh, very sad because you, you I mean, I feel like they're brothers. Now, if you talk to some uh, nationalistic Ukrainians, they'll say, uh, yeah, we're the little brother, and which, you know, means that they've always been picked on or whatever. But um, 
you know, before this whole thing happened in 2014, um, they were, they were, yeah, I mean, they were very, uh, at least the, the Ukrainians that I knew and, and still know, um, they're, they're family, you know, they're, they're yeah, part of the yeah. whole, whole old uh, Russian empire. So, yeah, well, Ukraine was part of Russia going back uh, close to hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, uh, and it was the breadbasket of it was the breadbasket of, of of the Russian Empire for for many many centuries. And then, of course, the I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but uh, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, the premier back in the fifties uh, and sixties, um, was Ukrainian and um, mm-hmm. uh, apparently in a drunken in a drunken. Uh, fit uh, he attached Crimea <laughs> to Ukraine, whereas it had been the it was actually the Crimea is the is the birthplace of Russian Orthodox the Russian Orthodox Church. So it goes back a thousand years with Russia, and so he uh, uh, vaingloriously attached it to uh, to uh, Ukraine, and, and then of course after. The, the 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 CIA uh, color revolution uh, in 2014. Uh, they want they, they they wanted no part of those fascists who had taken over the country. And I, I think that something like 95 percent of the people voted to go to to join back with Russia. So, uh, well, I'm going to add Crimea to my list of places to visit. Hopefully, I can tempt my wife to go. Uh, it sounds absolutely lovely, and now they've got that bridge. Go, they've got that bridge going in directly into um, into Russia, and it, it sounds lo- lovely. Tell us about Rostov on Don. I don't. I don't even know where it is. Where Where is that in Russia? Oh gosh, I'd have to point to it on the map. But uh, yeah, I, what uh, what I really love to the way I love to travel in Russia is to take the train. I mean, that's really uh really the the way to go if you have the time and uh you get these sleeper cars where you can you know you can get on the train late at night and then go to sleep and wake up uh, the next day Mm -hmm. and in in a new location um rostov on don is uh kind of uh, kind of to the to the west of uh to the to the southwest of stalingrad yeah and uh so we took okay. the train. So we took the train from Crimea, and we were going to do some touring. And um, because uh, I wanted to go to Volgorod, that's where that, you know I've been wanting to go there for a long time to Stalingrad because I knew they had a lot of great museums there. Mm-hmm. And my wife said, "Well, you know, let's let's stop. It's a long train ride, so let's stop in uh, Rostov uh, on Don okay. on the way." Okay, because she had been there once before, uh, and uh, she has a friend that that's from there and everything. So that was a really, you know, when you travel, sometimes if you don't know anything about where you're going, you're often very, very pleasantly surprised. And Rostov on Don is is uh, now that's also uh, Kozak territory. Um, that's uh, the Kozaks, uh, depending on the narrative you want to believe. Um, they they um, uh, evolved in both the uh, in the west and in the east of uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, you know that territory, and so this is the uh, western faction. But but there but there's uh, pretty much even though they evolved uh, separately, they are still um identical almost or or you know they they've, they've so i don't know what the real true story is that's just kind of what i've heard but anyway so that's kind of the western and you also have them in in um ukraine is as, as, as well the the kozak but um so it's it's what what rostov von don is is famous for now they were invaded of course by the germans during world war mm-hmm. 2 that was uh uh, but what what that is what the Rostov on Don is famous for or well known for is they have a, a just a fabulous uh, market uh, I guess you could call it a sook where they have just I mean right. they, yeah just uh, you know I mean it's open air uh, they have also I mean you know the fruits and the vegetables and just 
anything you want to, you know, buy at a sook uh, is there. My wife loves tea. She's um, uh, Russians still have a lot of, of home remedies that they use for illnesses. Mm-hmm. And my wife is an expert on tea. She has a tea for just about any condition. <laughs> so she had a great time in the tea markets there where she was buying all sorts of uh, different teas and things and actually um people think of of russians as uh, their national drink being vodka but actually actually their national drink is tea they drink a lot of tea they uh, love tea. i mean they drink coffee and of course they do drink vodka uh, not as much as uh, uh, not as much as as uh, people, you know, think uh, of of Russians as being you know, drunk on vodka all the time. I, I know a lot of Russians who don't drink at all. Um, I know some Russians that drink all the time, and just like in the U.S. and and but uh, Russians are very emotional people, and they love the party. So when we do get together, <laughs> the bottle of vodka is on the table, and, and uh, but, uh, depending on the occasion and who you're with, uh, you either have a couple of uh, shots uh, and drink yeah. it for a while, or else uh, sometimes the usually the bottle is empty by the time the. By the time the party <laughs> goes up, so, um, I hate to digress, or, or but speaking of parties, before we left for Yalta, uh, March first is a big party. Uh, it's the celebration of spring. Actually, it's for a whole week, um, and I guess they have one special day, or at least they. We had a party. Um, at my wife's condo for her and her friends and everything to celebrate the first day of spring on March 1st. And that's actually called, um, it's a pagan holiday, uh, but it's, it's, it goes back a long, long time. I mean, you know, Russia is an old country. It goes back before Christianity. A thousand although, years ago. Although, yeah. Although the church does uh, allow it, even though it's a pagan holiday, I don't know if they accept <laughs> it, but it's called, it's called butter week or pancake week. Uh, blini. Blini is the, Oh yeah. The blinis, of uh, course. Blinis. Yeah. And that's a, you know, that's uh blini pancakes are how Russians eat their, their caviar. They, they make uh, these little crepes and they put the caviar on it. Mm-hmm. So good. Sour, oh, it's our sour cream or whatever. Um, and, uh, so the pancake represents the full moon and, uh, uh. so, the, yeah, they have pancakes and, and, uh, uh, caviar and, uh, whatever, uh, other Russian food, uh, people ask me about Russian food and, um, you know, they have Russia's, uh, Eastern uh, Asian country, uh, European country. I don't think it's either. I think it's Russia is Russia, but it, uh, their food is anywhere from sushi to uh, to borscht. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, they have so many. They have hundreds of ethnic groups, <coughs> hundreds of yeah. ethnic groups in 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 Russia. So that it's a fusion. They have all sorts of food, and I think one of their favorites is uh, sashlik which is uh, Georgian, and it's shish kebab. And uh, they, I mean, almost any party they're going to have, uh, or any any event they're going to have, uh, sashlik and uh, caviar and blinis. And uh, New Year's is also a big, a big uh, celebration. Um, and there they'll have uh, all sorts of salads, uh, my wife calls them hot salads, which are made up of kind of like potato salad and cook salads mm-hmm. and so forth. Or, or, but I mean, every, they make salads out of everything from seaweed to uh, potatoes to meat, uh, fish. Um, one of my wife's specialty is called um, herring under the blanket. And, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a big dish. It's a it's a new it's a it's a party dish. It's a, it, and it takes a little bit of getting used to the taste of it. But they take uh, uh, salted herring and put it on the bottom, and then they put uh, uh, beet shredded beets on top of that, and then shredded uh, uh, carrots on the, cooked on top of that, and then they 
top it off with mayonnaise or sour cream mm. and like a big casserole and it's a beautiful beautiful dish but uh salted herring takes a little bit of uh getting used to um for you know most westerners i think they uh it's, it's you have to acquire a taste for it i've acquired it but it's not one of my favorites but so anyway, so that's that's the uh, that was the big celebration before we went to Yalta, and at um, Rostov on Don, it's uh, it's just a it's a beautiful it's a small city. It uh, reminded my wife uh, of a small Moscow, much you know cleaner, uh, not as spread out, and uh, just a very quaint city of the Don on the Don River there. And so sounds we, lovely. Oh, I got to tell you this though. Uh, I guess I'm hungry this morning, but uh, <laughs> the the cakes again, Russia. I love their cakes. They call them torts. They make the most beautiful cakes and pastries and um, chocolates. And I mean, it's just. I think you know. I think it's better than French pastries or. <laughs> Don't tell yeah. my wife. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> well, you know, Russia has a lot of French influence. Uh, yeah, I know. Back Peter with, the with, Great. Yeah. yeah so they. The great, yeah. yeah. So they. So, but the cakes are just in Rostov. They have these cake factories there, and well, they make them in in the little bakery shops, uh, and they're just, I mean, just fantastic. Just to fantastic. Die for. Well, you know, it's yeah. funny you mention all this. You know, and you sent me. You were somewhere. And you sent me while you were on your trip, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show, just because it just sound, seemed, sounded like such an amazing trip. You sent a photograph. You were in somebody's house the night before Lent or something, and it was just the the spread on the table mm-hmm. was right. just amazing. And and I was just sitting there saying, you know, everybody loves to diss and uh, diss Russian cuisine, and that it's awful, and all they eat is cabbage and and beet soup, borscht, and and the bread's bad, and everything's bad, and you know, the food's terrible, and and and, and yet everything that yeah, you it's... like that photograph you sent me and everything you're telling me is is, is it's just not true yeah that was that was the that was the first day of spring uh or the night before that was the night before oh. spring which also uh, was okay. well that was the night the the march 1st celebration of spring and is also oh, the okay. night before the beginning of the russian lent, lent. lent. okay uh, so they that. had a big feast that night you know because then after that they uh they call it fasting but they just don't eat meat for you know until after uh the russian easter i'm not sure what date that falls on but in any event that's uh yeah so that was that i'll try and send you that if you don't have that picture i'll try and send it to you again. oh no you you sent it to me oh, okay Go ahead. send it yeah. to me again send it to me again because you sent it to me as an email in the email and I'll and I'll and I'll put that in the I'll put that in the article yeah. on China Rising. So, um, well, listen. So Rostov is also on my list. Maybe I'll just duplicate your trip if I can get my wife to go. Tell us about Volgograd. You know, I know there's the Volga River. I know it's very famous because it used to be Stalingrad and then was, uh, however you want to look at it, ignominiously or or, or, or happily changed from Stalingrad. <laughs> to Volgograd after the um, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, I hear it's quite a city. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you say? Uh, yes, it is. It is quite a city, although the first impression I had was, uh, you know, I got there and it, it's, uh, uh, I'm like, well, I didn't see anything. It's like, uh, you know, this big uh, city. Now, we, we stayed in, we arrived at the train station at night. We had, uh, you know, again, we'd left Rostov on Don by train and, and, uh, and it was just kind of empty and a big, uh, kind of like Moscow, you know, all buildings all apart and everything. I'm like, well, you know, after Rostov, I'm like, well, you know, there, what, there's nothing here. Where, where's everything? You know, I was expecting something else, but in any event, uh, uh, as, uh, I learned, 
uh, we stayed at the In Tourist Hotel, which is right there on the Volga River, and that's where all the that's where all the the uh, fighting was. I, I didn't realize it, but uh, that was where all the fighting was was right there, and right next to that um, that hotel is um, uh, I think yeah I think it was a it was a originally a store. It's been turned into a museum, but that that is where the Russian uh, the um, German general surrendered to the russians and uh they had cool. quite a, yeah quite a fantastic museum there i mean with with uh you know with uh, a reproduction of the scene of the of the german general surrendering and uh just you know a lot of uh, a lot of um uh, uh you know a lot of a lot of things from from world war ii they had reproduced a lot of scenes of you know, people and in, in hospitals and being, you know, operated on on the kitchen table and and things of that sort. Of, all sorts of jeeps and uh, well, Russian Russian or German cars and mostly German cars that have been captured and um, all sorts of weapons and things like that. So it was, you know, we were right there. I mean, that's that's where everything that's where everything ended anyway. Uh, the whole city was captured, and you know the 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 Russians uh, they had their back to the Volga River, and I think Stalin gave them orders not to you know, not to surrender, and um, they didn't. They kept the one fighting a guerrilla warfare until finally, uh, I think they got reinforcements eventually, but uh, until the until they had the Germans surrounded, and then the Germans surrendered against uh, Hitler's. Uh, uh, orders not not to surrender, but of course once mm. once uh, if they had if they had, if they you know if they had captured Stalingrad the the they would have then moved on to uh, Moscow. Mm. And, uh, of course they did they did uh, siege Moscow, but they, they would have been able to uh, take maybe they would have been able to take Moscow or at least that would have been next. So they had to hold there. And I think that battle went on for about a year and wow. uh, you know people, yeah, we think you know we think of of we think of of um, you know being stuck two weeks in in our condos as, as being <laughs> for the coronavirus as being you know hard duty and yet these people they went without food and just uh, medicine and and uh, all sorts of uh, terrible conditions and and actually the the siege of Leningrad went on much longer. Uh, which is St. Petersburg now, went on yeah, much yeah, yeah. longer. You know, I mean, that went on forever. I mean, years. I don't know how many years that was. But this went on for, the siege of Stalingrad went on for about a year. And then uh, once uh, once the, that was, once the, the, the Russians had defeated the Germans there, uh, the German army pretty much started to collapse. And that's when uh, the Russians chased them all the way back to Berlin. And that's, you know, that's when the, that's when the U S decided that uh, maybe it'd be a good idea to try and get to Berlin (laughs) (laughs) when they got there. So yeah, I've, I've written about D-Day. It's, it's, it's a bit overblown after you see what the, after you see what the Russians uh, went through. Yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, the the feel, you know, I, uh, for for an American, if they've ever been to Gettysburg or to Antietam Battlefield, I know when I I used to go to Antietam Battlefield, uh, whenever I had relatives uh, visiting me in Washington, when I lived in Washington D.C., where I was where I grew up and we and worked and was lived all my life until I moved to Florida, we'd go there, and I'd always get this this um, eerie or emotional feeling. You know, it's just it's uh, kind of like ghost or whatever yeah. breathing down your neck, yeah. and that's how I felt in in Stalingrad. Is it was very emotional for me anyway. The, the you could just feel you know the blood and the dying and the suffering. Yeah, yeah I can just there, so. But they had the fantastic museums there. Uh, that wasn't the only one that we saw, and and of course that's also where um, on the on the um, Volga River, they have a huge statue of Mother Russia with the sword, you know, the sword. Oh, I've seen that photo. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's angry. Yeah, she was. 
Yeah, she's, uh, she's uh, I don't know, angry. She's on, she, or, yeah, yeah, she's, yeah she, she's on a mission. She's on a mission. <laughs> and they also, they also have the eternal flame there. And uh, I guess they're related to U.S. It's kind of like the, you know, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier yeah, where they yeah, have the yeah. honor guard and they change the guard, you know, every so hours. And it's a very big ceremony. And um, it's just... Uh, there's just a lot to see there. If you like, if, if someone likes museums and they are interested in World War II history, and uh, you know, it's it's just a. I think that's almost uh, uh, you know a place that I mean I've been I've wanted to go there for several years, so I was really quite happy to go there, and it was extremely, extremely interesting and and emotional. After the uh, fall of the Soviet Union and the, the rape and plunder by the West of, um, of uh, Russia, of course, uh, Stalingrad got its name changed to uh, Volgograd. Do you, uh, do you, uh, I mean, are there a, is there still a statue left of Stalin there? Do you, oh, what yeah. Do you, there's, what? Well, there's, I don't remember seeing a statue, but yeah, they, they definitely, I mean, they have pictures of them. And, um, you know, I mean, there's, they, yeah, they, they, uh, there probably is a statue of them somewhere. I just don't recall seeing the statue, okay. but certainly in the museums and everything, they have a picture of, uh, uncle Joe and, and, uh, no, I think he's revered there. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, there's people have mixed feelings about Stalin. I think, uh, uh, I, 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 a lot of people, um, uh, uh, you know, are very, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word I'm lost for the word, uh, nostalgic about yeah, Stalin. Nostalgic, yeah. 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 Very nostalgic. And a lot of people wish you were back, you know, they, they, yeah. uh, so, and then of course in the West, they always talk about, you know, his, uh, uh, all of all of the people that he killed and so forth and so on and uh, it's a it's a mixed it's a mixed story. Yeah, well, I think recent polls say that Russians now rank him as the greatest leader that Russia ever had. That's what yeah, I was reading. Yeah, it was, that that they realized they kind of realized now that he was that he, that he was he was pretty amazing. I mean, he basically say he basically saved the Soviet Union from from you know being taken over by by the german by the german fascists so pretty amazing leader yeah and and when you when you think about it, now of course i you know you can't condone um political or whatever uh killings and the gulag and all that sort of thing but if you look at almost every country that developed uh they pretty much killed off a lot of people during that development. I mean, you look at the U S they killed off the, the, uh, the, uh, millions of, of, uh, native, native Americans. Americans. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and I, I think it's, if you look at the British or you look at, uh, any, any country, I guess it's different. And Stalin did pull, uh, Russia from, you know, a peasant, uh, based, uh, a, a, economy into the modern age in a very mm -hmm. short period of time so people who say that mm -hmm. socialism or communism doesn't work well it worked very well yes <laughs> at the cost of a lot of lives but it it, it took uh it took russia from being a, a backward uh country into uh, being a superpower in yeah, 50 yeah. years or less yeah yeah and, yeah uh, pretty amazing eating the germans and uh, then they're having to rebuild their country after that. Uh, so uh, I think I think right now we're seeing with um, the coronavirus that uh, uh, sometimes you, you need a, a little bit of a uh, authoritarianism to mm -hmm. uh, uh, to uh, uh, it during an emergency or or during a, a time when uh, there's development or a war or, or whatever so yeah, yeah, yeah so i don't know anyway i'm I, maybe i sound like an apologist but yeah i have i have um i i i, I think you have to look at stalin with with uh, you know with with uh, uh relative to other world leaders and and uh uh what he accomplished as well as um uh, you know the the uh number of um 
plus you know plus the the authoritarianism and the deaths and so forth the famines so the caucus you went to the caucus i've been to the caucus it's uh, spectacular and and um um uh, what did you do there where'd you go well uh, my wife wanted to go to uh kislevo and uh, if I pronounce it right, and that is up in the Caucasus where they have uh, hot mineral waters and mm, yeah, nice. salts. And that's where that's where uh, sanitariums where people would go to uh, just to relax, really. They, you know, it's a, the word sanitarium has a different connotation in, in, in uh, the U.S. than it does in Russia. But. They go there to relax and to get treatments and uh, for different uh, ailments, uh, arthritis or, yeah, or, or or whatever, their heart disease or whatever. And, and the different sanitarium uh, have different um, specialties. So she wanted to go there and um, we planned to go there for, for two weeks because she wanted to go to one of the sanitariums there. And... Um, so we, we uh, they, you know, they had the mineral waters and the hot baths and uh, you go there for all sorts of uh, 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 treatments. Uh, mm -hmm. The treatments are, you know, they, they uh, use uh, all sort of massage and, and uh, steam baths and the, the saunas and massage. Sounds nice. That massage twice, I guess that uh, shows that I, I enjoyed the massage. And, and also they have other things like uh, uh, non-traditional medicine, such as magnets and, you know, the magnet therapy for arthritis. Mm -hmm. and they even have leeches that they will use for, yeah, leeches that they use for uh, arthritis. And, and, of course, plenty of, uh, of um, mineral water and hot baths. And then also uh, the diet, uh, they, they uh, have special diets for heart disease or kidney disease or whatever. And, and, uh, but it, it's, really, it's, really, uh, it's really a place to go and relax and just uh, pamper yourself and uh, get fed. Um, so I think during Soviet time, uh, every, everybody was entitled to, I believe, six mm -hmm. weeks six weeks in a sanitarium to just to go and relax and, and, um, rejuvenate themselves. So mm -hmm. she wanted to go. Then we were, we were there about, uh, a little over, a, we, we had already paid for two weeks and we did some touring around there. You know, it's just beautiful up there. The mountains and mm -hmm. the, the caucus uh, are just spectacular. Yeah. The, uh, spectacular mountains and waterfalls. And again, that's also, uh, the, the Kozaks are, are there and um, they still take that very seriously the Kozaks uh, both in Rostov on Don and, and uh, up in uh, Kislovo uh, the Kozaks uh, volunteer to patrol with the police they don't, they don't carry weapons but uh, they, uh, they do patrol the cities they keep the peace and um, although I didn't see much much uh, uh, non-peace to, 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 to that keep, but uh, as my wife says, the the Kozaks keep the police honest. So <laughs> <laughs> she says you can't buy the Kozaks, and, and you can tell they wear a distinctive they wear a distinctive hat uh, mm -hmm. with, with uh, that you can. And uh, there was a group of them there patrolling, and I, I asked if I could take their picture, but they declined. They didn't want their picture taken for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, but they uh, uh, they they patrol the streets, and then we also went to um, visit a, a a Kozak village where they had a, a little. Um, reproduction of Kozak life back, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago and, or maybe still, they still have some of the traditions and they put on a, uh, a, a performance for us that, uh, included, a, a Kozak wedding and, uh, also lunch again and, uh, Kozak moonshine. Oh boy. That stuff is, that stuff is strong, <laughs> which, uh, you know, oh, it's, really? it's, yeah, it's kind of like, um, I guess it's, it's, it's 
it's kind of like vodka, but it's it's better <laughs> and stronger. Wow. And so so that was that was pretty interesting as well. And uh, I think the I haven't really studied the Cossacks, but you know the Cossacks were the White Russians, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, the White yeah, Russians. they were the White Russians because they had land. Uh, they had, uh, you know, they didn't, they had land and they didn't want to give it up. Uh, the Cossacks uh, originally, from what I've read, um, were an eth not really an ethnic group, a people, a nation or whatever, but uh, they were kind of sandwiched between the Russian Empire and the, and the Polish uh, Lithuanian Empire, and they were in a precarious position. So they decided that uh, they would um, join the Russian Empire. And so they were very um, committed to the czar, uh, the czars, and the czars were very committed to them and made dukes and, and uh, uh, gave them all sorts of um, uh, special um, benefits. And so they, they were pretty well off. And, and their job was to guard the frontier for, for the Russian Empire. Uh, they were they were warriors. These people are warriors, and they and the and the czar gave them um, benefits and autonomy and uh, dukedom and everything, and and so they guarded the borderlands uh, in both the west and the east, and maybe in Siberia too. Along that those border, I'm not sure about that, but and. Uh, of course, they were in Ukraine too. Uh, Ukraine, what you, I believe, what you, the word Ukraine means is borderland. borderland. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So that's you know that's where they were there guarding the borderlands uh, for the Russian Empire, and they were warriors, and they uh, they helped to save the uh, uh, Russia both. Uh, uh, well, during World War II, I believe they helped, and also during Napoleon's invasion, and and uh, you know they helped to they helped to save Russia, Mother Russia, from invasion, uh, which Russia has always been threatened by uh, its neighbors, and Russia, I guess, has always threatened its neighbors too. That's how it got to be an empire. <laughs> 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 Well, that is amazing. Um, I've, yeah, I, you really got me excited. I would love, I would love to go back. I went there in 1984 on a kind of back course back then. It was the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and Andropov was the was the premier mm, back then. Okay. And, and uh, but I saw some beautiful, beautiful countryside. It was just, just so spectacular. And uh, well, listen, let's um, let's get into a little bit of politics. Um, uh, tell us about, of course, you left March 24th, which was last week. Uh, and you said when you first got there, coronavirus was essentially a non-issue. Uh, did that change while you were there? Yeah, that that started to change, uh, well, around the, around the middle of March. And uh, they started uh, reporting more cases. Uh, I mean, initially it was like 28 cases were reported. Yeah. And then they, they started uh, taking it more seriously. And we were up in the Caucasus, so we didn't have a lot of contact with Moscow or know too much of what was going on there. But... Everybody was no again. Everybody was normal. Nobody. We, I mean, we got together in, in groups and in, in the restaurants and cafeterias. And again, they've got great food up in the Caucasus too. They have that uh, just fantastic uh, food. But um, then, you know, I started hearing uh, that Moscow was shutting down airports and uh, that uh, Europe was uh, starting to. Um, not accept flights, uh, international flights. And so I started getting a little concerned that uh, we might get stuck. Well, Couldn't get stuck. Yeah, to, my yeah, wife said, this that sounds a, bad. Yeah, I know. My wife said this would be a great place to get stuck. But I'm like, well, I, I, I want to. I, I think we better get back to Moscow. And she was crying pretty much because she wanted to stay. Uh, not crying, but she she wanted to stay, and and uh, I said I think we better go. And so, uh, after some discussion, we decided that we would go ahead and and go back to Moscow. And the idea was, uh, well, first of all, they were 
they were closing down airports in Moscow. And I'm like, you know, now we were, took the train back. And um, so, you know, we, my wife wasn't worried. She said, oh, they're not going to shut the train down. And uh, well, they have shut the train down now, but uh, we took the train back. And at that point, uh, I think just one airport was open. We figured, well, we'll go sit it out in my wife's condo in, in Moscow and until <laughs> things kind of blow over. But uh, instead of blowing over, they started, you know, I was a skeptic about this uh, coronavirus from the beginning. So I've become more of a believer now, although I don't, I, I know that the government is not telling us the truth, yeah. the whole truth and nothing, but there's a lot of lying going on. And, and so I waver back and forth, but I figured we, we'd at least, at least in, in Moscow, I, I know my way around. I know how to buy food. I, I know if, if my wife got sick, I could take care of her. And if she got sick, she could take care. You know, I knew that that was our home base. But then we got to Moscow and, and we realized that uh, if we flew back, uh, we were supposed to fly back uh, May 1st, but we weren't going to be able to fly because uh, our, our they wouldn't let you know transfers in europe you couldn't mm -hmm. fly from moscow to to uh germany and then germany to the u.s so uh the only uh so i said you know we better just go before they shut down all the airports and so we bought a ticket on um, aerofloat which has direct flights to jfk and to miami although i think miami flights had been suspended so we bought a we bought it we got a ticket and aerofloat Again, this is a, maybe in the old days, Aeroflot wasn't a great airline, but it's a great airline now, I think. I, I prefer to fly Aeroflot if I can um, because it's, for one thing, it's a direct flight and you don't have yeah. that layover. But the service is fantastic on Aeroflot and I've just never, I've always, in, I've always liked it um, every time I've used it. So we, we bought a ticket and we flew back to JFK and then from JFK to, to Tampa, Florida. And as soon as we arrived in Tampa, because the airplane had come from New York, uh, the health department here in Tampa met the airplane and gave everybody a notice saying that they had to isolate for two yeah, self isolate. Yeah. Right. I think they're making any I think they're making everybody who comes to Florida from out of state or they're telling everybody to isolate for two weeks yeah, if they, yeah. but you have a lot of new yorkers coming down here which, yeah yeah snow snowbirds yeah well they're also the escaping, they're also escaping from new york to come down here and they're and people aren't too happy the floridians aren't too happy about that because they <laughs> oh, florida has a big outbreak of uh, coronavirus too supposedly oh but, my gosh uh, there was something else i was going to tell you but i can't uh it slipped my mind. I'm getting like Biden. I'm getting a little bit uh, fuzzy. <laughs> You're a long way from Biden's poor mental state. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Is is the is the medical care in Russia? That's universal? what I. That's, that's what I wanted. To, is the I, medical I, care universal or is it private? I mean, how does it work? Well, yes and no. <laughs> um, first of all, you can buy. Like as a tourist, I never have, but you can buy medical insurance very inexpensively. Um, they do have public clinics, which uh, I'm going to say are universal health care, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Now, my wife is a pensioner. She's uh, at age 55. Or she's still a Russian citizen. She has dual citizenship, U.S. and Russian. So mm -hmm. she's a pensioner. So she gets... <laughs> She gets free health care in Russia. She gets free wow. transportation on the buses and on the metro, wow. and the train and all that sort of thing. She gets a small stipend, not enough to live on. Uh, the pensions aren't enough to live on. But no, I've had I've uh, used their medical care several times. And, and, you know, Russians are very smart people and they have very educated doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh the couple of times that i've used them um once i had last year i had a very bad sinus infection and uh ended up i had to go three times because first i went to see one doctor and then they she spent about 45 minutes with me and everything and then she recommended me to an ear nose and throat guy and so forth and um but no the medical care very good uh i don't know how 
prepared they are to handle this um, this outbreak, uh, you know, some an epidemic. I don't know if they're. I'm. I don't know if I. You know, I. I'm a little. I. I just don't know. I. Don't, I don't know what the medical care would be like during an epidemic. But I've used their medical care. It's very good. My wife. My wife. Every year when she goes, that's when she gets all of her checkups and everything. Uh, she, okay. She's very healthy and she doesn't use the U.S. medical care very much. So um, smart woman. Quite good. And that, and right now they're, you know, they're they're. Uh, they're um, beyond or, or they've never, you know, these double blind studies have, have not, uh, they're, they're not as, um, they, they're more accepting of, of medicine that has, that's, they think has been proven effective and, but not necessarily gone through double blind studies and so forth. So right now they're using chloroquine and yeah, chloroquine, uh, yeah, for malaria. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's apparently mice, it's working really well. Yeah, yeah, it's working very well. They're using it, and they're also using it in France, from what I understand. And Russia has been helping Italy. They've been sending supplies to Italy, which has been hard hit, and humanitarian supplies. And they sent the. A, plane load of masks to the u.s uh yeah uh, for trump for, for trump yeah yeah isn't that amazing know. yeah it really is amazing it's uh but so um the thing is that you know not being fluent in russian uh not really knowing my way around the way um you know my wife does that i was concerned that yeah if we get sick you know how would i uh how would I maneuver the healthcare? I mean, there, there's a clinic right near uh, my wife's village. She lives actually outside of Moscow. There's a clinic, and I've been to it several times, and that's where my wife goes. And so, uh, no, there's, the Russians are smart people, uh, very intelligent people, um, great people, actually. They're, if you have a Russian friend, uh, he's, a, he's a real friend. And... Uh, they're very, they're, they're still um, very much um, uh, in the village, I guess you'd say, that they have friends and they, they party and they uh, talk to each other on the phone and they visit each other and they drop in. And uh, they just, they're just, once you make a Russian friend, my experience has been once you make a Russian friend, it's, he's a friend for life. And, uh, will do anything for you if if you need it and vice versa um so that's so the medical care yeah it's you know i was concerned about it with an epidemic but in general um it's uh i i'm i think i've had good care and the doctor certainly has been they spend a lot more time with you they spend 45 mm -hmm. minutes with you and they you know they're not in a hurry and um, they have all the modern medicines and everything. So, so as well as the, the, um, tr you know, the traditional, I don't know, maybe you'd call it Eastern medicine like they have mm -hmm. in China. So mm -hmm. I guess, I guess some of your experiences in China are probably, you can probably relate to my experiences in Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they mix they mix them both in in China, and you you have a choice. You can say I want traditional Chinese medicine, or I want Western medicine, or I want both. And so they'll they'll do whatever you recommend. So uh, which is nice, right? Please com please compare and contrast uh, uh, what's going on uh, politically in um, Russia, neoliberalism uh, versus the reemergence of the Communist Party. Yes, and unfortunately, and I don't like to um, talk negative about Russian politics too much. I feel like I'm a visitor there and everything. But over the years, I've noticed that um, there's more criticism of Putin, especially in the last few years, uh, because neoliberalism, Russia is not a communist or socialist country. They're cutting back on um on on uh, the safety nets on the on the on the universal 
benefits. That's why I say I can't really answer the, your question whether they have universal health care or not. I think if you ask if you ask Putin, he would say they have universal health care there. But if you ask the average person, they would say maybe not. Um, so they they're cutting back on child care. They're cutting back on a lot of those benefits. Um, and really, um, it's the uh, I th- I think that the country is like the U.S. It's it's more and more leans towards being run by the oligarchs, the wealthy, the the upper middle class. Uh, there's a greater uh, there's a growing um, uh, disparity between the rich and the poor, uh, inequality, and uh, so it's um, Putin. Uh, be, came under a lot of criticism about a year ago when he uh, raised the retirement age. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think it, it was fifty five for women and maybe sixty for men, and now it's sixty for women and sixty five for men, or something like that. But he came under a lot of criti- criticism for that. A lot of people resented it because they've been cutting back on over the years. They've been cutting and cutting and cutting the the communist. Uh, social socialist social programs and people resent that uh, they don't like they don't like that being cut back and they they see so he is coming under criticism more I think still probably something like 62 percent of the people there are give them a, a, their approval rating um, and of course if if you ask a lot of the young people uh, will remark to me well he's just been there too long it's time for a change and I asked them, I said, well, who, you know, who's the alternative? And they really don't have a good answer. <laughs> but um, I don't, I'm sure there are opposition parties. And it, what worries me is the fifth column. And yeah, the U.S., yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. the U.S. Is, is in there stirring this up and they're stirring the pot. And the, uh, they're, you talk about Russian meddling in U.S. elections, which is a, if you if you talk to a Russian about that, they're going to laugh in your face because oh, yeah, they know that joke. Yeah, they know it. I mean, they they uh, I I I don't know. I one guy said, "Yeah, my my friend here, he's a hacker, and he he's the one that uh, uh, threw your elections in the U.S. <laughs> uh, all by himself. <laughs> he posted some ads on Facebook, and they're laughing. And they know it's a joke. They know it's." Uh, just the other propaganda. thing is, yeah. The other thing is, you know, they have the internet there. They have millions of computers. Anybody can go on a computer. I can go on Facebook. I can go on op-ed news. I can go on on any website really. Uh, there may be some websites that the Russians won't let you go on, but I mean, any any. I never ran into any real problems with the with the internet. I was posting I was posting articles to op-ed news and and so forth from Russia. So anybody can go on the internet and they can post uh you know whatever kind of uh crazy things they want to post on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And of course they say, oh well this this uh we have identified this ad as coming from Russia. Well there's millions of computers in Russia. Maybe, you know, I, I'm not going to say that uh, I, I just don't know what the motive would be for for Putin to want to disrupt uh, the, the U.S. Uh, so-called democracy. But in any event, I'm sure that they have their spies and their programs and everything. But people laugh in your face. If, and, and Trump is not Trump is not as popular as he used to be when I was there in 2016. Oh, everybody loved Trump. They thought he was fantastic. Not everybody, but a lot of people. They 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 thought Trump was. Uh, they they thought he was because he was talking. They peace and they also, I think, just the Russian um, kind of uh, uh, hooliganism in them that uh, you know they liked the fact that he was disruptive and and mm-hmm. and uh, a bit of a rebel. Stirring. A rebel, and and they have their own Trump in in uh, in the Duma there, and I don't I don't know his name, I can't remember his name, but they have their own Trump there in the Duma who raises hell all the time, and and then of course the 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 communists are making a comeback. I don't think they're a serious um, uh, threat to the current system there, uh, but uh, they they do. There's probably 
weekly, almost weekly protest in uh, Moscow on both sides, on every side, the anti-Putin faction, the communist faction. <laughs> and so people talk about a lack of political freedom in Russia. It's not, uh, you know, you, I'm just like in the U.S., I guess if you go too far, you can get in big trouble. But uh, as far as political freedom goes, uh, they can voice their opinion. They can go to demonstrations. They are required to register for their demonstrations, which, uh, you know, is a little bit. Uh, we, I, I, but here in the U.S. now we have uh, free speech zones where you have to go. Yeah, to yeah. inside cages. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the same thing. And as far as personal freedom goes, uh, as far as I have noticed, the Russians have personal as much personal freedom as they want. Uh, they go wherever they want to. I've been going there for years. Nobody has ever stopped me on the street and asked for my pa- well, except for my passport. No one, no policeman has ever stopped me. No, um, no one has ever questioned me or anything. Uh, so, you know, it's it's um, it's not a police state. In fact, a lot of the yeah. police don't even carry guns. They're not. They're not. I, I never saw any. You know, that armed the way the U.S. police are yeah. or or Humvees patrolling the streets. Although I do understand that now that, you know, Russia is pretty, is completely shut down. Um, and I understand that the, the military is patrolling the streets and telling people to stay off the streets and uh, stay in their house. I think, I think supposedly that's to last for one week. My wife said, yeah, they, they have to because uh, you give Russians a week off and the first thing they're going to do is go to the forest and have a party and, <laughs> and, uh, and have have shish leak and you know shish kebab and barbecue and vodka and they'll make a big party out of it so i mean that's <laughs> my, my wife because that's the russian spirit they just uh, yeah. they, they just love to you know they love to they're just very uh social people they just love to get together but no people are taking it seriously they are isolating they were isolating when i left uh, the friends weren't getting together and the way they used to and so forth. So, um, but I don't know, I guess we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, but Russia is pretty much shut down now. They're taking it very seriously now. Just, um, one last thing, uh, the, um, Putin devolved, um, requested that the Duma pass laws, like a new constitution to, cause the constitution they had was, pretty much um, written with the uh, heavy hand of the United States um, back in 19, you know, the early 90s. Uh, And Putin actually devolved uh, substantial power from the presidency to the Duma, which is their, which is their legislature. Uh, And so how are the people taking the, the new constitution and and what are their thoughts that Putin is actually giving up power and giving it, giving more of it back to the legislature? That's a big complaint that I hear, too, is that um, actually uh, the new constitution, they are going to have a referendum on it. So I think it is going to be um, voted on by the people. But supposedly the new constitution does give more power to the Duma and takes power away from from the um, uh, president, uh, but uh, I'm not sure if that's true in actuality. The, the big complaint is that the new constitution has a term limit of two terms for the, for the president, and uh, which you at first thought you would say, well, that means Putin isn't going to be able to run again in 2024, but under the new constitution, everybody's terms would be rolled back to zero which means that putin would be able two more times he would be able to run two more times if if he wanted to and if they elected him which means that he could be in power until two uh theoretically until 2036 so uh, yeah i did hear complaints about that that uh he's especially from younger people that he's been there too long and that uh they think that this is um, a power grab on on his part um I, you know, obviously, uh, the rolling it back to zero is to his benefit if he wants to stay on. 
Uh, they do have elections there. Uh, they, they, people can say they're not democratic enough uh, compared to the U.S. I don't know if we have much room to complain. Oh, but, uh, yeah, but they do so elect their, from, from, from what I understand, they do elect their mayors. They elect their um, uh, legislate, the legislative, the Duma. Um, the Duma, I think, represents the whole country. It's not like divided up into regions. So they do have they do have elections. It's uh, probably it's certainly a lot more democratic than say Saudi Arabia, or Honduras. <laughs> uh, and of course, the U.S. is going to always complain that any country they don't like is not democratic enough. But um, as far as as far as um, I mean, I think that's up to the Russians to decide. And they do have. Uh, they, they they do have elections. They do have some political freedom. I guess you can always debate whether it's enough or not. Uh, but yeah, the new constitution. A lot of people are very upset about it. A lot of, mm -hmm. I mean, I, the the people who aren't upset about it, I guess, aren't very vocal. But the people who are upset about yeah, it yeah. are vocal. And um, so. Um, Anyway, it's it's um, things are. Putin doesn't run the whole country, and and he's not uh, universally loved, but uh, he is still very popular. And uh, I, you know, other than that, I don't. I listen when I talk, when I talk to Russians. I mostly listen about what they say about their political system, but I really don't um, contribute. To mm -hmm. my opinion about Russian politics, I'll tell them anything they want to hear about U.S. politics. But um, you know, you're. I always feel like when I go to a foreign country, I'm a guest there, and it's not really my place to. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you go to somebody's home, and you don't really want to start <laughs> criticizing <laughs> their. You know, I don't. You know, for to, for practical reasons as well as for. Um, p to be polite, I don't. For one thing, I don't. I've had strangers try and engage me and talk, and especially after they've had a few drinks, um, I don't. I remember the the case where um, that woman Marina in the U.S. was arrested and thrown in jail for talking politics here in the U.S. about U.S. politics. So I'm always kind of aware that. Uh, you never know who's listening or who might become offended. Uh, maybe some petty police officer or something overhears something or some petty bureaucrat uh, would overhear something and uh, uh, make a make a scandal out of it and cause me trouble or something. So, yeah. so I just don't I don't engage in that with strangers. But friends. Yeah, we talk politics and I listen and I'll ask questions. And that's uh, about it. I'll tell them anything they want to know about U.S. politics and what a dissident I am, and and, uh, <laughs> and how I, I hate all these wars. And but you know, Americans are still quite admired and loved. I don't know why. I tell them they th they always blame it all on the government. They say they say uh, I say you know the U.S. is doing this and that and you know the and they say oh that's uh, the government that's uh, politics you know we we still love americans i don't know why i try to tell them that <laughs> americans are not nice people <laughs> that uh, you know that they would drop a nuclear bomb on russia and not blink an eye in, but, in a heartbeat <laughs> yeah in a heartbeat but they still they still the americans i don't know they still uh, us north americans still have a uh, for some reason although they understand too that they have a saying there they say you know russians don't smile a lot so when you go to russia you get the opinion that they're grumpy but um they're kind of like new yorkers i guess but uh, they have an expression that americans smile a lot but they don't mean it <laughs> so, so they they know, they know, you know, they know. It, it takes more energy to smile than it does to... To, uh, to be grumpy. To be grumpy. So, you know, the, when I first started going there, we'd get on the, on the bus or the subway, and my wife would punch me and say, quit smiling. People will think something's wrong with you. <laughs> so, but, you know, once you break through that 
frown on their face. They, if you stop, you know, if you stop somebody and ask them for directions, they'll take you by the hand. And, you know, if you ask them where the Metro is, they'll stop and you provide, you know, take you by the hand almost and take you to the Metro, or yeah. at least they'll, they'll, they'll try and help a stranger. If, uh, yeah, you know, of course there's, there, you know, people are people and there's good ones and bad ones, but I haven't had any, I have not personally had any bad experiences. None. Excellent. Excellent. So, well, that's so a that's wonderful awesome. way to close out. And uh, I really wanted to get the friends, fans, and followers of China Rising Radio Sign Land around the world a chance to hear about Russia from someone who just was there and has a little bit, of, has an inside track with, uh, with family there. Uh, because the propaganda is relentless, and, and I appreciate your honest and frank t- frank uh, discussion. Before we before we say goodbye, David, um, what is your what are, what are your current plans, and what what, what where are y'all? What, what's your next trip? Wow, I haven't even thought about that, uh, or not. I haven't thought about it very much. Although I did say to my wife, I said next time we go to um, Russia, I'd like to go to Azerbaijan. Oh, yeah. I, I, I understand. I don't know what the requirements are for, um, I like the caucuses. I, you know, last year we went to Georgia this year, we went up to the caucuses are really beautiful. Also, I'd like, to, I'd like to go to Volgorod, uh, not Volgorod, um, Vladivostok, you know, way yeah, over. I would too. Yeah. The San Francisco of, uh, the San Francisco of Russia on the, on the, on the East coast, not far from right. China. Right, right, over near Japan, uh, and I'd uh, also like to. I'd also like to go to Siberia. Uh, we know Siberia people from Siberia. It's uh, they. I'm sure it'd be very interesting. You know, that it's again, it's people when they hear Siberia, they probably think one thing, but uh, it's 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 a normal place, I believe. Uh, although. They do complain about the Chinese encroachment in Siberia. (laughs) (laughs) So that's well. And again, again with the neoliberalism, uh, I understand that they're selling a lot of the forest to the Chinese, and the Chinese are in there cutting it. Yeah, that's what I've heard. That the Chinese are in there. I'll I'll have to do some research on that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, the Chinese are apparently. uh, do a lot of farming there. They've, they've, uh, so I don't know. Well, that anyway. I, knew about. I, I didn't know about cutting down for, but I'll check, I'll check out the forest angle. That's, well, that's interesting. my wife complains about it all the time. She says, oh, there's, really? there's, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. She, says, yeah. Well, she, so. she sounds like she knows what she's talking about. Well, listen, David, thank you so much for being on. This has been wonderful. It's been nice to take a break from co- coronavirus. That's all I've been doing for the last two months, and I'm absolutely sick of it. Uh, but it's the event of the of, of the early 21st century. I mean, it's just changing the world as we know it, and unfortunately for the worst. And um, and so, uh, but it's so nice to have some nice news and some and some fresh news and some and some positive news from Russia. And I really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. It's uh, my pleasure, and it's nice to talk to you again. All right. We'll stay in touch, and send me that picture again of you at the um, the, 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 pre, the pre-March the uh, pre 1st uh, feast, and I'll put that in the, I'll put that in the article because it was really a great photo. Yeah, I'll try and send you a few things. Um, yeah, please uh, do. Whatever, whatever you send yeah. me, I'll post, well, uh, I'll post and, great. and uh, st- stuff, stuff that you think might be worth worth uh, uh, contributing visually to what we talked about. Great. All right. Thanks, we'll talk Jeff. to you later, David. I'll let you know when this thing goes up. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.